Man, I got to be careful. I got so wound up last week. I, 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 I got wound up. And I, I'm trying to, this is supposed to be the last of that series on the presence of the Lord. And uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to calm down. I, I know what happened first service. And if I get wired, um, so just thanks for tolerating the, the child on the inside of me that just gets excited about the reality that Jesus saved my life. <laughs> Uh, I, I just get excited about what Jesus has and is and continues to do. He's the best thing ever happened to me. Uh, I just want you to know. And so I, 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 I don't do this because I have to. I do it because I, I love the Lord and just um, really. And, and, and I think I said it last week. Uh, one of the primary goals, assignments that I've had in my life has been to teach people how to pray. And uh, I actually believe it's the most important thing that the Lord's assigned to me is to teach people how to enter into the presence of the Lord through prayer. And the second thing is to teach them how to praise. And uh, because he inhabits the praises of his people, right? And uh, thirdly, how to live in the presence of the Lord and not in the presence of your head. So, uh, so I think I'm endeavoring to do that this morning. I'm going to read the gospel. I was ready to, you know, my keynote verse is the one I've been using for the last several weeks is, one thing I have desired and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire his temple. I, I, one thing David desired, and that's to be in the presence of God and to behold his beauty. Uh, but I read uh, the lectionary, I follow the lectionary in the daily office. Uh, if you haven't realized that I lead prayer every Monday through Friday at 7. Uh, and I got to reading the gospel, and, and it just has ignited me again. If you stand with me, and we'll read Matthew chapter 16, we'll read 13 through 20. And um, I just think we ought to stand to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed, happy, full of joy are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood, your head, your mind, your logic has not revealed this to you, but my Father, who is a spirit in heaven, has made it known. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Wow. And then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Lord, I pray this morning that you would anoint these lips for a few moments that I might say what you would want me to say. I pray that you would anoint the ears in this room that they might hear specifically what they need to hear in their moment of this time. I pray that the interaction of your words and their hearing would produce inside of them miracles, miracles of transformation, of transcendence. I ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. you may be seated. You know, we're living in a story. Every one of us live in the story that we tell ourselves, that inner narrative that we replay over and over again on the inside, those inner narratives that we speak about ourselves that shape us, shape what we do. It actually shapes the future. If you want to change your life or the shape of your life, you actually have to change the story that you tell yourself. Amen. And so many times we tell ourselves these snippets, right? We, these snippets. I mean, Pops, he pushed me. Pops, he, 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 he hit me. Pops, he, that's probably not the whole story. I just want you to know. There's probably more to the story than he pushed me. You really need to hear the whole story before you can evaluate the reality. But most of the time, people confuse their Instagram with their whole life. They confuse, I, mean, I don't know, is it Twitter or is it an X? I don't, or a TikTok. I mean, most of the time, we define ourselves based on a scene, a snapshot of our life. 
and it's not the whole story. One scene of your life cannot tell you the reality of who you really are. You don't want to judge your life based on the scene that you're living right now because it's just one snapshot, one Instagram. And, and one of the reasons I get so excited in my life is because, I, I, uh, listen, I, I know the whole story. See, if you, if you don't understand this Christ story, you don't understand how to put together the snapshots or the scenes. King David, the shepherd warrior king, he had many different Instagram photos of his life. He had many different scenes that he went through. He was the shepherd warrior king, uh, the man that carried the presence of God back into the Ark of the Covenant. But the story about David could be summed up by just this one little verse found in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart. Uh, the story of David is that God said, this is a man that's after my heart who will do all of my will. The story of David is that he was hungry, thirsty, chasing, longing, always reaching for the presence of God. And God said, the story of David is he had a passion for me. You don't want to judge the story of David based on just the shepherding or the warring or even his failures as a king. You want to recognize that God said, this is the man that captured my heart. David discovered the presence of God in the pasture as a shepherd. The shepherd himself discovered the shepherd of the souls of men. And David wrote so many of the Psalms that if I had time, I, I would just sit and read to you the Psalms because I actually think the Psalms, the songs of David can carry you into the very presence of God. And I have to tell you, I, I, I'm beyond trying to measure my intelligence of God against the PhDs or the theology or the hermeneutics or the dogma or the doctrine or those that have memorized things. Let me tell you that the presence of God is about encountering the one that can change you into his image. And David said, the Lord is my, say my, shepherd. The Lord is my light and my salvation, my strength, my shield, my rock, my fortress. The, he discovered that you are my hiding place and you will protect me in trouble. You'll surround me with songs of deliverance. You are my shield, my glory, the one that lifts my head. The shepherd in the pasture defined and found the shepherd of his soul. And he said, you're mine. We're one. So many times I ask people, okay, kind of, who's God to you? And they'll start giving me their Baptist or their, or their Presbyterian or their Methodist or their Mimas or whomever. And they'll start telling me their dogma about God. And what I really am looking for is he yours. The Lord is my Savior, my Lord, my healer, my strength, my song. I am intimately and personally acquainted with this God who left heaven and come in, came into my life. He was with me with the lion, the bear, the Goliath, and in the midst of my imperfection, he's mine. He's personal. So many people are trying to learn about God rather than seeing him face to face. It is that intimacy that you begin to know that she's my wife. She's not yours. You can know Annie, but you can't know Annie. You see, no one can define to you the relationship with God. No one can put him in a box and hand him to you. You have to discover him as your own in the midst of your own individual unique life in which you're living. And David said, you are mine and you're always mine. No wonder the Lord spoke to him. He said, be still and know me. No wonder David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. No wonder David said, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust will never leave nor forsake, but will always be with me. David had developed an intimate relationship with the God of heaven and of earth and knew that when he needed him, he would show up in strength and in power. Touch your neighbor. Jesus is my Lord, my Savior, my fortress, my healer, my hope, my only joy. He is my glory and the lifter of my head. And David teaches us in the book of Psalms how to enter into the presence of God. David teaches us the way in. He said, make a joyful shout 
to the Lord, all ye lands, and seek the Lord with gladness, and come before him with singing. I don't understand, Pastor. I kind of like your teaching. But that singing, and it's so loud, and it's so long. Listen to me. I can't preach until I get in his presence, and I have to get into his presence by the only way that is known to us. Make a joyful shout, all ye lands, and come before the Lord with singing and gladness. You know why most people are left with their diatribes of doctrine is because they never learned how to shout as they went in. Oh, I'm going to upset religious people this morning because there's no way into him. Oh, here I come. (laughs) You'll never get in. No. He said, you need to shout before we start. I think next week we'll begin service by saying, okay, one, two, three, shout. Oh, well. (laughs) We don't know how to be joyful unless there's something to be joyful about. So we're waiting to be, we're waiting to unwrap the thing before we get excited. We're waiting to, and he said, no, before you receive, I want you to be joyful. Before you even know what's going to happen, I just want you to be joyful because you can trust me that whatever I give to you, it's going to enter into his courts with thanksgiving. Oh, for the Lord is good. David understood and had experienced the presence of God even in the worst of times and in the midst of his own imperfections. And David would write, blessed, happy, super joyful is the man whose sins are forgiven. Oh, whose transgressions have been wiped out. Blessed, happy, joyful is the man, the woman that knows that God is not imputing his sins against him. Every one of you this morning ought to be shouting because God forgave you. Oh, (laughs) he's given you this gift called grace. And this grace is at work in you, according to Paul, to will and to do his good pleasure. Happy, joyful is the man who knows his sins have not been imputed against him. (laughs) Whose name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. No wonder, he said, in his presence is the fullness of that joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. If we know that God is in this room this morning, it ought to be marked with an exuberance of joy and of bliss and of unspeakable joy because we know this morning that he holds nothing against us and keeps nothing from us but is with us in every moment of our lives to accomplish through us that which he has already determined. Oh, my God. Christianity since the Reformation has been reduced to your knowledge of him through your head and not through the experience of his presence who confirms to you that you are his and he is yours. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. This is my beloved upon whom my favor rests. David discovered and developed this reality of being in the presence of God. Joy is just happiness on steroids. And most people have never experienced joy, so they remain weary and strengthless because the joy of the Lord is my strength. But most people are looking for happiness in all the wrong places. And they settle for these fleeting moments of happiness rather than the permanent reality of knowing that God is yours. Listen, I, I, I'm thinking this morning of a particular moment, a particular time when my father gave me a particular gift, and the gift was extraordinary. For a 12-year-old, it was absolutely extraordinary. It was above and beyond anything I ever thought my father would give to me at that moment. And the gift created, I was surprised. Have you ever been surprised? And when you're surprised, that's when joy really is there because su- joy and surprise kind of goes uh, Surprise! I'm, I'm, I'm not going to cast you away from my presence. I'm going to create in you a clean heart, and I'm not going to take you. Uh, surprise! And that joy, that emotion that floods. And the gift created that in me, but what the gift pointed to was that everything I had been previously worried about and concerned about that was going on in my life at the moment was a lie. Yeah. That the gift was so extraordinary that it destroyed that inner narrative that was going on in my life. I just knew certain things were about to happen. But when, God, when Dad gave me that gift, I realized none of that was true. That I didn't have to be worried. Next time you get ready to buy somebody a gift, buy them a gift 
that doesn't just thrill them because they got the gift, because it's not really about the gift. It's about what the gift points to, the gift symbolizes, the gift reveals about the heart of the one that gave the gift. Oh, you didn't. I'd have to get too personal this morning, and I ain't got time. And I don't want to be that personal to you. Surprise! See, the presence of the Lord and the gift of his presence that comes by grace will change the way you feel. It'll alter your mindset, give you a different attitude, a whole new perspective. It'll destroy the weaknesses and the fears. It'll take away all of those belief systems that have hitherto limited us. No wonder the Bible says there is joy in his presence because joy is the fruit, according to Paul, of the Holy Spirit. The joy can't be worked up, can't be bought, can't be sought, but the joy is the byproduct, the fruit of the presence of the Holy Spirit that's in our lives. And that joy is our strength. It's empowering. And Christians have underestimated the power of joy. In fact, most of our churches are designed to keep you seated. Most of our churches are designed to keep you calm. Most of our gatherings are really rather confined to here's where you sit and here's what you do, and then we'll go home. And the reality of it is, is this morning we should be encountering the God that has saved your life, healed your life, sustained your life, and that when you're weak, he's strong. We should be celebrating the fact that this God is still at work among us. But the construct, the mind, of man. You see, when Jesus showed up, he said, hey, I've got good news for you. Great joy for all. Say all. This would rip the rug out of most Protestant Catholic traditions. Great joy to all. Red, yellow, black, and white, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalians. Because see, there weren't any. They were just pagans. Great news for pagans. I'm here. <laughs> I got great news for all of you alls. I'm here. And when I'm here, it's going to fix you. See? And then as he gets ready to leave at the end of 33 and a half years, he said, I'm telling you this stuff so my joy would remain in you. I mean, the whole revelation of Jesus on the earth is to bring his joy to you, that you don't have to earn your righteousness, but he's going to give you right standing. Oh, yeah. See, some of you have been so brainwashed by religion that you can't think that you might get this for free. Say free. Freely given. Freely you have received. Freely you got to give it away. Stay tuned because it's to your advantage if I go away, he says to them. Because when I go away, I'm going to send another one, a helper, an advocate, the Holy Spirit. I love the way Eugene Peterson translates it in the message version. He said, I'm going to send a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I'm going to send a friend that's not going to live on the outside, but on the inside. It's to your advantage that this flesh and blood manifestation, this Jesus, goes, sits on a throne, but I'll send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not an addendum, Father, Son, and old what's his name. No, the Holy Spirit is God. And this God that David said in his presence is joy is now on the inside of us. Touch your neighbor and say, "There's he, he, yeah. I know where he's at. He's in you. Amen. So, <laughs> you know, who you're with can change things. I've been in a few places that I got in because of who I was with. <laughs> I got in because of whose friend I was. I was a friend of somebody, and because I was a friend of somebody, they opened the door and let me in there. Listen, I'm not Roman Catholic, but I knew somebody who knew the dude, and I got in because I was with him. Oh, you didn't get it. <laughs> I hadn't even bought a ticket. <laughs> hey, who you're with matters. Who you're conscious of who you're with matters. Who's with you this morning? He said, it's to your advantage because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Remember, David said, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not your Holy Spirit. Jesus comes so the Holy Spirit can get inside, so that God can get in you, in you. Here's the message of the gospel. Christ has moved into you. Amen. He's in there. Say, he's in there. But like most of the, listen, even Paul showed up and said, okay, You've heard about Jesus. Again, the Message Bible says, did he just live in your mind or has he, have you received the Holy Spirit? 
Can I tell you the religious demons over the last 500 years have told more than 60%, maybe 70% of the body of Christ in America that the Holy Spirit really doesn't do that stuff. How would you know? I'm very serious. I'm being a little bit coy, but there's so many people that go to churches that we don't, we don't want any of that happen here. Well, because he doesn't do that. How would you know? If you don't receive him, how do you know what he would do? You're just, you're just telling rumors because you don't know because you ain't received him. Because I got news for you. I didn't think he did it either, but then he showed up and he did what I didn't think he could do. Not because I believed it, but because he just does what he does, whether I believe it or not. Oh, well, you'll get that in a minute. The Holy Spirit, God himself, comes to live inside of this thing that he created. And the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, keeping the law, the rituals, or all the other stuff Paul would write. But in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not about the law. It's about this relationship that is exploding inside of the people that have said yes to Jesus. And a lot of the people that have said yes to Jesus want to keep it quiet. <laughs> I've had a problem most of my life, and that's to stay quiet. <laughs> Listen, the Holy Spirit is here this morning, Amen. and he's in you. And when you go get in your Volkswagen and drive off, he's going to go with you. And when you walk into your two-bedroom house and go in there and turn on whatever, he's going to be with you. And when you go to sleep, he's going to be with you. And you get up in the morning, he's going to be with you. The question is not whether or not he's with you. The question is whether or not you know it. The question is not whether or not you've got, how many people in here believe Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. Surprise, the Holy Spirit's in you. I know that just twists the head of Pentecostals. No, they're not. Yes, they are. Yes, they're not. He says, if you have not the Holy Spirit, you are none of his. Jesus is Lord. He's in you. He's in you. The question is not whether or not you have him, but does he have you? And we let him have this piece. <laughs> maybe this piece. But, but we don't want him to take over. God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> See, you can be in the presence of God and not even know he's here. I mean, Elijah was looking at the storm, the lightning and the thunder and all that. And God said, I ain't in that. But I'm in the still. You can be in the presence of God and not even be aware of it. Those two men running from Emmaus and the third dude shows up. And he goes, why are you so mopey? And they said, well, we had hoped that he was the one. And the one they had hoped that was the one was the one that was talking to him, but they didn't even know the one that they had been hoping in. I couldn't say that again. But, <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, while you're de depressed, the one that can fix your depression's right there. You woke up this morning feeling bad, but he's, he's right there. You can be in the presence of God and even not even know that he's there because your mind is running 100 miles an hour. I mean, Mary was washing his feet with her hair, pouring oil over him. She chose the one thing necessary. And now she looks at him and says, where is he? Because he didn't look like what she thought he ought to look like post-resurrection. You can be in the presence of God and mistake him for a gardener. Or a traveler, or lightning and flashes. See, most people today aren't aware that the God that made them, the God that saved them, the God that's always with them is inside of them. He is a spirit. And it's not by power or might, but by the spirit of the living God. It's not by your intellect, it's by Him. He. There's a great story. I, there once was an artist, a sculptor, who was working hard with a hammer and a chisel on a huge block of marble. And a little boy, a little child, was there watching him as he chiseled on that stone, and pieces of the stone were falling away. But the boy got bored with the... And so he left and came back a few weeks later only to see this beautiful lion where the stone once was. And the little boy went to the sculptor, the artist, with great excitement. He said, sir, tell me, how did you know there was a lion in the marble? 
And the artist said, I knew there was a lion in the marble because before I saw the lion in the marble, I saw him in my own heart. You see, the secret is that it was the lion in my heart that was recognizing the lion in the marble. Do you understand that you have to recognize the lion that's in you? There is a lion in the marble of your life. There is a God that many religious people say are not, but he is inside of you. And only the master artist can reveal to you who he is in you. When he made you, he put himself in you, human being. You, human being, he put himself in you. He made you in his image and his likeness. And who you really are is who he is. And he's in there, hidden by all this other stuff. (laughs) And my job, in fact, your job is to help people recognize who's in them, who's with them. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Not who do some say. No, no, I want to know what you say, who you say. I'm telling you, I live most of my life asking people, well, now who is God to you? Well, he's this, he's that, he's disappointing to most people. But who is God to you? You see, because how you see and define who God is will determine then how you see yourself. And what you say about him, you're really saying about you. And please understand that St. John would write in one of his little letters back there towards the end of the book that as he is, so am I. So your description of God will also be the description of your And unfortunately, the inner narratives that we tell ourselves, the inner narratives that most of the time have been predicated by what other people have told us, those inner narratives, you see, flesh and blood cannot reveal God to you. He said, it's impossible, but my Father, the God of the Spirit, you need revelation knowledge. You need knowledge that comes spirit to spirit, heart to heart, lion to lion. The visible world is the veil of the invisible world so that all that exists or happens visibly conceals and yet suggests and above all subserves a system of persons, facts, and events. You see, to look at Christ was to see the Father. And Christ is in you. Thus, to look at you is to see the Christ. But we go look in a mirror and we don't see the marble Or the lion, we see only the stone. See, you can be in the presence of God and unfortunately not be aware that he's with you. It seems to me that the noisy, the busy world conspires against us and our hearing of that voice that speaks to us and tries to keep us deaf. It's not surprising that many times you and I often wonder in the midst of our occupied and preoccupied lives, if there is really anything spiritually happening in our lives. See, our lives are filled with so many events. I have so many calendars now, it's, it's absurd. So many events that we often wonder if we can get it all done. And at the same time, uh, many times, most of the time, I I feel unfulfilled in all the busyness and the preoccupations of my life. In fact, the word there, I don't have time to dig into it, is it's absurd. The many activities in which we were involved in, the many concerns that preoccupy us and the sounds that surround us have made it very hard to hear what God is saying to us and in us and through us. And so we compulsively keep going and going and going. That that really is the epitome of spiritual exhaustion and of separation. It's really the way of spiritual death. The problem, however, is not how do we find spiritual life, but can we actually see what is going on, that God is actually at work inside of us, chipping away, sculpting us, revealing to us, See, you and I tasked this morning is to open our eyes and recognize that God is at work in us, both to will and to do. 
The skillful task of an artist is to liberate the lion that's on the inside, to set free the God that's in us. I, I'm like you. I wake up every morning and think of my list, and I look at Annie and say, I'm tired before I get out of bed. I wake up in the morning, and I have these notes, and then I got that thing that reminds me of things. How many of you? I don't. You can talk to that thing, and it'll talk back to you and tell you you didn't get it done. <laughs> right? List upon list. And I wake up in the morning. I oh, my God, I got to talk to these people. I got to do this. I got to do that. I don't know. How am I going to get this done? And God says, they don't want to talk to you. I said, they don't want to talk to me. She goes, no, you got nothing. You ain't got any wisdom for them. They don't want to talk to you. They want to talk to me. You're just the RV. You're, you're, you're just, listen, quit feeling so tired because you ain't going to do nothing anyway. I'm going to do it. The God that's inside of you, the grace that's in you. I mean, Paul says, I work harder than all the rest of them slugs. <laughs> Quote, unquote, I work harder than all the rest of them apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God that's on the inside of me. We grow weary because we think the list and the stuff we got to do, we got to do, but it's not I. I can do nothing, but the Christ in me can do all things. You can relax because there's a God on the inside of you that's going to live through you. But you've been told to behave. You've been told to perform. You've been told that if you don't do this and if you do this and if you don't measure up to this and you can't get into this and you can't do that and you can't marry that and you won't accomplish this, that is the world system, not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has nothing to do with that. The kingdom of God has to do with trusting the God who works in you to accomplish through you his will and his purposes. And can I tell you, it's more than having a 401 or a 501 or whatever they are. It's more than having a retirement. It's about the God that's on the inside of you that can heal and set free. Oh, my God. The intelligence of man. Where were you when he laid out the world? Where were you when he put the stars and he put the fish where were you, Job? I know you've been having a rough moment, but you're asking all the wrong questions. Why is this happening to me? Where were you? I've got this under control. If I was able to put the stars there and the water here, if I'm able to do that, I'm able to help you in your little life. Shut up and trust me. Be still and know that I am your shepherd and your Lord and your master and Stop it. There's about 89% of Christianity. I want to say, would you just stop for God's sakes? The 90s were filled with how-tos. I couldn't do the first one. <laughs> There's a lion in you. Who do you say that I am? See, these things I've spoken to you that your joy, your strength would be made full. How? What do we do, Pastor? Where are we at? Joy. Look at your and say, joy. Most people are waiting for something to happen so that they can have a feeling. Joy. A man has joy. It's in Proverbs. I hope they put it on the screen. It's in Proverbs. A man has joy by the words that come out of his or her mouth. All you got to do is listen to people and you'll find out why they're depressed. <laughs> they're depressing themselves. A man has joy by what comes out of his mouth. To wake up every morning and say, I am so excited to see what God's going to do with this mess that I call a calendar. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do. i got all these demands on my life and crap has happened and I don't know the way out. But I know that the Lord is with me and I know that he can. And I'm just going to trust him to guide my steps. Through the valley of the shadow of death, through the wilderness, through the mountain, God, let's... Yeah. A man has joy by the answer. Yeah. 
see that in our narrative. That we keep, it's not really the words you say to me or your wife or your boss. It's the ones you speak to yourself. You're talking yourself out of having a good day. I had somebody that day said, how's your day going? I said, I have to get up every day and say it's good. Because if I look at it, it hoovers. Vacuum. Do I need to go further? You know what a vacuum does? Never mind. <laughs> Children's church. Uh, uh. <laughs> See, I have to get up every day and hear the inner narrative that's going off on the inside of me and realize that I'm not talking joyfully to myself or about myself or about God. And see, most people are so loyal to their dysfunction that they'll never break out of anything. It's just the way I am, Pastor. You know how many times I hear people tell me that? It's just the way I am. Oh, so you're loyal to dysfunction. <laughs> this is the way I am. I'm just not a worshiper. Oh, okay. You know, you do realize this. The point is to change you. <laughs> it, it, and that is the entire point. And listen, education hadn't done it. Bible school didn't do it. I think the only hope is Pentecost. <laughs> oh, you didn't get it. The only hope of the body of Christ becoming what God called them to be is the presence of the Holy Spirit descending in such power that it alters Peter in a moment. Yes. And he comes out of hiding into the street. Amen. It's the only hope. Yeah, but, 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 but that's not... I know you've already determined that God is this. This is your doctrine. This is what you believe. And, 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 and you, you, you've already settled for the system of who you think you are, your thoughts, your way of being. <laughs> and so what's the answer? Repent. Change your mind. You don't everything about God that you think you know. You don't know everything about yourself that you think you know. You don't know everything about your neighbor that you think you know. You need to change your mind. You need to alter your opinion. And, and, and alter your opinion. <laughs> hmm. It's just the way I am. Okay, when I was a little boy, I picked my nose in public. <laughs> There's a verse in there that says, when I was a child, I did childish things. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. When, when I was a boy, you could get away with temper tantrums. Oh, I feel like <laughs> This is what I would say to most people who are not experiencing joy. Put away childish things. I think Paul says it pretty bluntly. Just grow up. <laughs> Just grow up. You do understand that joy is a gift, but you've got to learn how to walk in it. Listen, salvation is a gift, but you've got to learn how to walk in it. If you never develop the disciplines and the practices that will increase the salvation that's within inside of you, it will never go into maturity. If you don't receive the peace but then learn know how to be in peace, if you, if you never discipline yourself, if you never change the way you think and the way you speak, you'll never experience the fullness of the joy that God has for you. You've got to take responsibility for the words that come out of your own mouth. I mean... How many of you in here believe Jesus is Lord? Amen. You believed it in your heart and you said it with your mouth and you got saved and you get to go to Disneyland when you die. <laughs> That's the message. I would suggest to you that if you take the same truth and you believe in your heart that God is with you and that if he's with you, you have joy, you could begin to confess that Jesus is my joy. my glory, the lifter of my head. You could alter the words that come out of your mouth and you could chip away those things that are hiding the lion that's on the inside. If you're a parent, I just want you to know you have a hammer and a chisel. Oh, you didn't get it. And, and, and guess what? When they turn 18... You'll need a bigger hammer <laughs> and a sharper chisel. Oh, you didn't get it. 
I am so grateful for the people that have helped me to chip away those things in my life that would reveal who it was that I am and whose image and whom I have been created. Let me tell you, the miracle is in your mouth. Hmm. It's not enough just to avoid being negative. There's a lot of people that avoid being negative. I'm, I'm suggesting that in the midst of a world that's gone weary, you might have to get offensive. You, you might have to chase that giant. I come at you in the name of the God of the heavenly armies. I'm going to take your head off, and I'm going to feed it to the buzzards. You might have to go on the offensive this morning and not just not be negative, but become very very positive and use the name of the Lord to accomplish those things in your life that he has called you to accomplish. He is listening to your words. Who do you say that I am? Well, I believe you're the son of the living God that can kill the lion and the bear with my hands. I believe you're the son of the living God that can take down a giant with a piece of gravel. I believe you're the son of God that can forgive my sin and create in me a clean heart and cause me to walk uprightly. That's who I believe you are this morning. I believe that you created and molded me in your image and that inside of me is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what I believe. We need to understand that God uses our words to accomplish the things of our own life. David, obviously, my object lesson of the last few weeks, came home from fighting a battle for, for people that had lied to them. He took his whole army and went to destroy the enemy of his enemy. And when he comes home, the enemy of his enemy had come into his camp and stolen everything, taken his wives and the wives of his generals and his footmen, robbed him blind. And he comes back home, and it says that the people that he led were greatly distressed. In fact, one translation says they were distressed, disquieted, and discontent. Have you ever been in the midst of a mob? It was a mob. And the Bible says they thought of stoning David. But... The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. <laughs> when, when everybody else is saying, he ain't no good, he done, David knew how to go on the inside because the inner narrative, are you still here? The narrative on the inside, the story on the inside is that he was one with God. And that God would never leave him. And so he encouraged himself in the reality that God was with him. Sometimes you never find encouragement in the world that surrounds you or the circumstances in which you might be living or the diagnosis that you might have. But you can go on the inside. And the translation says he strengthened, he found joy in the Lord that was on the inside. Your answer is not outside of you. Your answer is on the inside of you. He made you his home. And he's home. He's home. He's in you this morning. There's a lion in you. And you might have to stop listening to what some say and what the circumstances are shouting and what they're talking about the apocalyptic nature of this generation. You might have to go on the inside and realize that the lion of the tribe of Judah is on the inside of you. And you might need to roar with a sound of praise and see things begin. Oh, my God. And can I tell you, he won't change your circumstances. He'll reveal you. Yeah. He'll reveal the lion that's in you. And the lion will change the circumstances. You'll go do great things. You'll go accomplish. This is better than their shouting, Cherry. I'm just telling you, this is better than the shout I'm getting out here. <laughs> this week when you see me, just roar. When you see me somewhere, just go. <laughs> my grandchildren do. I told them this story. My grandchildren walk at me. Go, go. How's school this week? 
I just keep waiting for a kindergarten teacher to call me someday. (laughs) (laughs) David strengthened himself. Paul says rejoice, and again I say rejoice. They put me in a prison, and Silas and I will sing. You put me in a storm, and we'll cheer up. Paul understood how to rejoice. Peter said, don't think it's strange when some fiery trial comes to try you. Rejoice. James, the other apostle, just says, count it all joy when you fall into this mess. In other words, whatever the trial, the tribulation, or the trauma is that you're experiencing, go ahead and begin to shout because God's going to use it to chip away the stone that's covering up the lion. You're God's secret weapon. God has rolled your stone into that situation, and in a few minutes, he's going to uncover the lion that just snuck into that thing. Oh, you're not. Whatever you're facing this morning, God's about to reveal the lion that's on the inside of you. You might as well begin to rejoice now. You might as well begin to change the narrative that's on the inside. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is my strength, my power. My whole purpose for being here is to reveal the image of the God that's on the inside of me. Can I, can I finish? If you get a chance this afternoon, go, go look at this verse. I, I think it's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. He, he said, you suffered long with those who were in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your goods because you knew you had better and lasting possessions. I've been robbed a few times. Sometimes painfully robbed. Had to look at my children once and say, we just got robbed. Painfully robbed. I I doubt any of us are going to go through life and not be robbed. At one time or another, the enemy's going to come and... But when you do, sucker. The Bible says he has to pay back seven times what he stole. And I still believe that book. Amen. See, the enemy's trying to steal your joy. That's the whole purpose of the pressures of life, is to rob you of your confidence in God, to steal from you that joyful bliss of knowing that he'll never let go of you. But if the devil can't take your joy, he can't keep your stuff. He can't keep your life. The purpose of this message this morning is I'm telling you, even in the midst of difficult moments, you need to rejoice. Because it is the joy of God that is the strength that the Lord uses to destroy the enemy at his very schemes. You need to alter that inner narrative on the inside. I love what Micah says, I may have fallen, but you better look out. I will stand up. I may have had a moment, but that one scene of my life does not determine who I truly am. Am I making any sense to people in this room? I'm trying to encourage you. Trying to encourage you. There's a lion inside of you. Alter your words. Turn off bad religion. Turn it off. I'm telling you, I'm sick and tired of bad religion. Sick and tired, and it raises its ugly head every once in a while. I've been around long enough. About every 10 years, it comes back around. <sighs> Tries to get you to perform or do this or do that or some other little nutty thing. Reach out and touch your neighbor. Hello, lion. Mmm. <sighs> <sighs> God uses visible things to convey invisible realities. Every one of your children are lions. Don't allow false religion to cover it up. They'll spend their life trying to perform as a rock when the truth of the matter is, is the lion on the inside of them can outperform anything. God, I love you this morning. 
I thank you that you chose us before the foundation of the world. I thank you that you knew before that we couldn't depend upon ourselves, so you chose to be in us. I thank you that you decided before you made me that you'd come and make yourself known to me through the cross of Calvary. That your love is unconditional, irrevocable, undeniable. And that you, O oh God, are shaping and forming me. That I might know that love and that peace and that joy. And Lord, I pray over your people this morning, particularly those who have lost something. I pray that you restore joy to them and hope to them in the knowledge that there is everlasting peace and joy and that this world is but a facade of the reality of eternity hallelujah show them the really real stuff god show them the really real you god break them out of their mind and bring them into the inspiration of your presence and your spirit mm. This morning.